Ashiro Honda once said that the tragedy of monsters is the fact that they are born too tall, too strong, and too heavy. And at least in the context of the films, he was right. These attributes have led to Godzilla having many disagreements with the Japanese military. But at least in the context of pop culture, these attributes have led to the opposite for Godzilla. They've allowed him to prosper and produce 28 movies. But I want to analyze this and discover what it truly is about Godzilla that attracts people to him and why he's been so endearing. And the only way to truly do that successfully is to review every Godzilla movie ever made. Some people might be angry, but regardless, welcome to Zazubar's Godzilla Palooza. Greetings space monsters with unclear origins, I am Zazubar, and welcome back to Godzilla Palooza. It's day 22, and today, oh today, today we're going to be taking a look at the Godzilla film that came out the year that I was born, yeah. Today we're going to be taking a look at 1994's Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla. Um, Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla is easily the weakest film in the Heisei series of Godzilla. I'm not going to go f as far to call it the worst, unquote, quote unquote, because I don't think it's awful. My problem with Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla is that it is a part of the Heisei series. And because of that, um, it has to live up to a standard set about by the previous films. And it also has to live up to those standards because it makes many references to events of those films. Like, there's many references to Biolanti in this film, there's many references to Mothra, there's many references to the previous film. And when you don't live up to those expectations, there's a problem there. And also, of course, the problem with that all is that this is a running continuity, and Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla, like the previous film, is taking events from the previous Heisei films and molding that into its story. And what makes it disappointing and ultimately weak is the tone. It's a really, really campy Godzilla movie. There's a lot of comedy in it. Um, well, not a lot of comedy, a lot of like goofiness, like characters acting very cartoony. And it's not really funny, it's just stupid. Like, um, there's this one shot where, um, the main human human villain, quote unquote, or guy who dies midway for the, through the movie for no reason, um, named Kubo, who um, Akubo, I think is his name, and um, he's really goofily trying to activate a um, um, this machine, and it just looks so goofy and goofy for no reason. Um, but the film is filled with that. It's filled with just goofy moments. And I would be totally fine with it if it was made 20 years previous. If this film was made in the in the um, in the Showa series, it wouldn't be nearly as noticeable or as bad as it is because of it, because it's made in the High State series. You're comparing it to films that are taken very seriously and are badass reworkings of classic Godzilla films. Space Godzilla is not really like that. It, not only is it not a reworking, but that's not a problem. It's just, you cannot take it seriously, and if you try, you're totally, totally gonna hate the movie even more so than you already do. Um, but, but now that I've got that out there, um, if you look at this film as a campy Godzilla movie, 
it's not terrible. Um, it's definitely weak, and the big reason for that is because it feels very been there, done that. Like the plot and the story progression and just the end, the third act feels very like we've been here before. And just the last 15, 20 minutes of the movie, well, not, no, no, not that, not that short. The last about 40 minutes of the movie are all very typical and very, very predictable. It's basically, there's an evil monster, we've got to stop him. And we've been there before. We've been there with Ghidra. And, um, ah, it's just, it's very plain Godzilla storytelling. And, um, what really makes it disappointing, and, okay, so if we look at this film as a campy Godzilla movie, it's not really bad, it's just typical. Here's what makes it bad. Because, um, the ideas that are introduced in the first act are quite interesting. And they're not carried through into the second or third act, and the film becomes a very typical Godzilla movie. About 30, 40 minutes in the movie, it becomes very typical. And it didn't really start out that way. There were some very interesting ideas posed. My favorite one, and this will bring us into the plot synopsis, was the idea of a, um, a character who was, um, who has become kind of a, a recluse because of what Godzilla did to him. Um, and that'll bring us into the plot synopsis, I guess. Um, and ideas like that are introduced early on, and they're either dropped or not completed, um, or simply they've forgotten and make way for some very predictable plot points and confusing plot points. So, um, the film is, you know, in terms of the Heisei series, bad because it's unbelievably goofy and campy, and the rest of the series isn't like that. And as a campy Godzilla film, it's bad because the ideas posed in the beginning are interesting and not carried through. So that'll bring us into the plot synopsis of Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla. I don't want to do it too. I don't, I don't want to do this one too long because it's got a lot of elements that are really dropped. So I'm not going to really bring them up until later on when we get into them. Basically, the plot goes like this: Godzilla cells were somehow. We'll get into this in a minute. Somehow um, taken up into space and combined with the energy of black holes, white holes, and star matter, became a monster called Space Godzilla. A Godzilla-like a Godzilla -like creature that is comprised of crystals and Godzilla cells. Uh, Space Godzilla is on his way to Earth, just as a new counter-Godzilla weapon is being created called Mogera. Now, Mogera is, of course, a character who first appeared in the Toho film The Mysterians back in the 50s, and this is a reworking of him. And uh, this is the G-Force's new counter-G weapon after Mechagodzilla. Um, at the same time, there is another G-Force plan to, that, um, in case uh, Project M, Project Mogera, fails, they have a, a secondary plan being run up by uh, um, an old Godzilla character named uh, Asuka Gondo, and um, a new character named Makubo and Miki Sagusa. Basically, the plan is called Project T, and the plan is to control Godzilla's actions using telepathy. Um, all these plot lines converge on a small island called Bass Island in the South Pacific, where um, Space Godzilla first arrives on Earth and fights Godzilla, and where Project T is put into action but fails, and um, Godzilla and Space Godzilla fight for the first time. Space Godzilla defeats Godzilla and kidnaps Godzilla's, um, I'm going to say Godzilla's son, even though it's not his son, Godzilla Jr., and puts him inside this crystallized prison. And Space Godzilla flies off and Godzilla returns to the sea um, down on himself, I guess is the word to say. Um, the plot carries on later with Mogera being rebuilt after a primary confrontation with Space Godzilla earlier in the film where um, Mogera was shot up into space and fought Space Godzilla and was defeated. Mogera is rebuilt um, and Mogera is sent after Space Godzilla who was attacking Fukuoka um, and creating a... Uh, a crystallized kind of fortress where he can absorb energy from a tower at the center of the city and is basically creating a fortress for himself to consume energy because that's basically what he does, he consumes energy. Mogera is sent after him but also at the same time Godzilla arrives at another side of Japan and begins to move towards Space Godzilla. Um, Mogera and Godzilla both converge on Space Godzilla in Fukuoka and a big fight is underway. Um, many things are <laughs> many things happen. Um, with, with the combined efforts of Mogera, the G-Force team piloting Mogera, and Godzilla, they managed to destroy the tower that Space Godzilla is consuming energy from, 
destroy the crystals on Space Godzilla's back that allowed him to absorb, absorb energy and ultimately do indeed defeat Space Godzilla with the use of Godzilla's uh, spiral atomic breath that was introduced in the previous film that I forgot to mention. Basically, random... Well, in the previous film, it was, it was explained. R when Rodan um, passed on his energies into Godzilla, Godzilla's atomic breath got stronger. In this film, at, randomly at the end, he just powers up and be begins to use this super spiral atomic breath to kill Space Godzilla. Space Godzilla is defeated. The human cast is left with a destroyed Mogera and are left to lament the events of the film, and Godzilla returns to the sea to be with his son. Or his whatever, his adopted son. Um, and then that's the end of the film. All right, so here's the thing with the plot. It's not bad in premise, and um, I mean, the idea of a, mon of a monster being comprised of Godzilla cells up in space is really cool, and um, the premise is definitely interesting and um, could lead to a great Godzilla monster. And um, the problem with it is that there's a lot of interesting ideas in this film like that introduced and either quickly forgotten or quickly um, devolve into something worse. Um, I already mentioned um, the character of Yuki, who um, Yuki in the film is a very bitter man and is living on Bass Island where Godzilla frequently comes up on shore to take care of his steps of his adopted son um, and plans to use a special bullet he used filled with this thing, uh, filled with like blood coagulant or something that he wants to use to kill Godzilla. He wants to kill Godzilla for a, fa a very interesting reason. Apparently, he was a friend of Colonel Gondo from um, Godzilla vs. Biollante, and when Godzilla killed uh, Gondo in that film, Yuki, won a re Yuki swore revenge. That's fascinating and is a great use of continuity. Um, I guess I should get into this now just because I mentioned it. Um, it's a great use of continuity if we ignore the events of Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah. So I think I should mention this briefly since this film makes a really big use of continuity, especially with Space Godzilla's origins. Um, Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla makes some, um, I already talked about this earlier, but makes um, quite a few references to previous Godzilla films, um, like Biollante, Battle for Earth, and um, Biollante, uh, excuse me, Biollante, Battle for Earth, and um, G-Forces carried over from the previous film. Um, and uh, Godzilla's son is carried over from the previous film. Um, Here's the thing, um, Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah has been hot hotly debated on, on the comments of my review of it, and um, on whether or not uh, Godzilla, where, whether or not Godzilla existed before that film, whether or not um, what Godzilla was there, was it the 54 Godzilla, was it the Heisei Godzilla, you know, whatever. The problem with all of that is it can never really matter with the rest of the Heisei series, because Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla makes multiple references to Biollante, which means that those the events of that, those film, that film must have happened, because people remember Biollante, and um, Gondo is dead. So even if the origin of Space Godzilla, which they present two, one of them can, it makes a lot of sense, the other one is debatable. Um, basically they pass out the idea of um, Space Godzilla being created by um, the cells of Biollante, which went into the space at the end of that film, or the one that I buy more, um, the Godzilla cells that Mothra carried up into space when she went to go destroy the meteorite. Oh, when Mothra fought Godzilla in that film. I buy that one only because it makes more sense, because it seems really, really more far-fetched for me for Biollante to be uh, Biollante cells to go up into space. Um, here's the point of it all. Um, th that, you know, we can ignore the Biollante thing, but the Gondo thing we cannot ignore. Um, so... The Heisei Godzilla must have existed because of Gondo. He's, he's mentioned in this film, and his sister is a primary character in this film and falls in love with Yuki. However, in the next film, 54 is mentioned. So that film must have happened, must have happened as well. Here's my, here's my big point with all this. The continuity of the Heisei series is great when they want it to be great. It sucks when they when they are lazy and don't want it to be good. For example, the mentioning of past Godzilla events before Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah. Now, I made my case for the plot hole in that film, and I still stand by it, but my point is that no matter what, um, what Godzilla was existing, whatever, whatever, any, any, of these, any of these things you can debate, it becomes a problem later because both Godzillas are mentioned. So, that's my point with it. 
Um, the continuity of the High State series becomes very diluted at this point, with Biolanti being mentioned and 54 being a big part of the next film. So that's my point with it, that, you know, we could have our pissing matches over which Godzilla was, was born or which one wasn't, but in the end, it doesn't really matter because these films make references to both. So, problem there. Um, so, that's my big continuity flaw um, or problem. But um, again, I, I, my big point with it is that we can ultimately ignore it because um, I ultimately don't want to make, make it a criticism because the continuity of the Heisei series is becoming bad anyway. I, I don't mean like the continuity itself is bad, but I mean the actual event carryover is becoming problematic because of the time travel. So um, I, just wanted, I just wanted to bring that up now. At this point, I don't care. I'll just pretend that all this happened in the same universe just so that way we can have the next film and we can have the likability of Yuki situation in this film. So let's just pretend the time travel never happened, shall we? Um, so I really like Yuki's motivations um, and he's easily the best part about the film. His motivations are very interesting, very believable, and um, I like how he's not passionately in hate over Godzilla. I mean, he is, but he's very... He's very quiet about it. He doesn't even tell anyone about why he wants to kill Godzilla. He just acts like it's a given, and I really like that. And um, I'm actually getting into the human characters now, and I didn't finish about the plot. Hmm. Whatever, I'll finish this up about Yuki, and then we, so we don't have to talk about him in a minute. Um, like, he just acts like it's a given. Like, he does, doesn't even have to explain himself. Um, Asuka Gondo actually has to explain why he is so hating of Godzilla um, when someone asks, asks her. Um, and, uh, it's a little disappointing that she doesn't hate Godzilla as much as he does because, you know, it was her brother, and, um, you know, you'd think that she'd hate Godzilla too, even though she's a big proponent to save him in this film, but whatever, um, confusing motivations, but maybe she acknowledges that it wasn't really Godzilla's fault. I don't know, whatever, whatever her reasons are. But it makes Yuki a very interesting character, and ultimately makes him very likable and a well a welcome addition to the Godzilla human casts. Um, so um, that's Yuki. I wanted to bring him up, bring him up a little later, but um, it's really all I have to say about him. He's the best part about the film because he's the one interesting idea that's carried over throughout the entire film. His arc of realizing that Godzilla is ultimately a uh, feeling and a creature that deserves to live is good and is carried over and is really the only thing in the film that isn't dropped. Um, so he's a very interesting idea. It becomes somewhat diluted towards the middle of the film and I find the ending very, very corny. Um, but I do like his arc, I like his character, but in the end, his realization at the end is a little corny, but I do really like his character. So Yuki is easily the best part of the film. Um, to go back to the plot, um, oh my god, I got so off track. Um, my big criticism of the plot is that a lot of elements are quickly introduced that are also quickly forgotten. Um, Project T is in the first act and a little bit of the second act, and then it's totally forgotten. It's so superfluous to the plot. The idea is, let's use Mickey Seguss to control Godzilla. Interesting idea. And then what happens? It fails. Okay, what happens next? Oh, it turns out that the guy whose idea was to do this was a traitor and goes against G-Force to give this plan to the Japanese Mafia who want to use Godzilla as a weapon. Oh my god, that's a really cool idea. What's done with it? Absolutely nothing. Um, the Japanese Mafia is killed by Yuki and G-Force and Akubo is killed by Space Godzilla and Project T is never mentioned again and ultimately is totally superfluous in the plot except to provide human drama. Isn't that great? No, it's lazy, and it's a really interesting idea that's quickly forgotten so that way we can get into the Space Godzilla stuff, and ah, oh, it's stupid! Um, I apologize for that, um, but I really do not like that Project T is a really interesting idea and has an awesome potential climax with the Japanese Mafia using Godzilla as a weapon, but it's, it's just forgotten, and ultimately is superfluous to the Space Godzilla story. 
The idea of Godzilla being controlled by the Mafia as a weapon is really cool and should have been in a different movie with a focus on that or where that subplot would connect better with the A story. It doesn't connect at all with the A story of Space Godzilla in this film. It's just a random subplot that doesn't connect. It's interesting but quickly forgotten and is ultimately superfluous. Um... Uh, it's just, it's really distracting, and the fact is that it's a problem because it takes up so much screen time of the first and second act, and it really just comes off as filler, like, oh, Space Godzilla's story isn't enough to con consume a two, um, an hour and 45 minute movie, so we'll put this in. It's just stupid and lazy, and um, it makes the film feel very, very jagged, um, in both its pacing and in its storytelling in general, and, and plotting. So it's just ultimately superfluous, it's an interesting idea with poor execution and poor payoff. Just a great idea, poorly executed. Um, overall, the film is extremely poorly paced. Um, it's incredibly boring. Um, the first act is easily the best part of the movie. That part, that act is pretty well paced. Um, in that, things happen, seem to happen naturally. Interesting plot elements are brought in at a quick enough and um, natural enough pace where it's believable and is also, it keeps you intrigued. All that is gone as soon as Space Godzilla shows up. As soon as Space Godzilla shows up, actually before that, um, well, okay. Once Godzilla shows up and is beginning to be experimented with um, on, by, Pro, by Project T and Mickey Sagusa, excuse me, the film becomes very poorly paced and boring. Um, the scene where they attempt to fire the Project T mind control thing into Godzilla's head is takes too long. And um, Yuki attempting to shoot Godzilla with that bullet that could potentially kill him takes too long, and it's boring. And that bullet as well is an interesting plot element um, and is also quickly forgotten. So, um... Ugh, um I just wish that uh, the, some of these plot elements were... Um, continued on, but with the pacing, the scenes are painfully boring. Um, things happen. Things. The movie drags like nobody's business. Um, that first, that scene I just talked about drags. Um, the scenes with the Japanese mafia and um, G Force attempting to save Mickey Sagusa from them. It's boring. Ah, um, oh, it's just so poorly paced. The third act. Oh my God. It, too, drags and drags and drags. It is one of the worst end Godzilla fights I have ever seen. You barely see Godzilla do anything. It's about a 40-minute long end monster battle. Awesome. Most Godzilla fights, end fights are only about 9 or 10 minutes. The ending fight of this film is a 40-minute long progression. From the monsters coming together, to the fight, to the conclusion of the fight. It is so boring because the entire time we are focusing on the annoying human cast and what they're doing inside Mogera. And it's just painful and boring and is not what we came here to see. So, film is terribly paced. The ending drags like nobody's business. It's not that interesting. Ah, the ending is so boring. I was just ready to turn the film off and record the review without do, without even watching the rest of the movie. Um, I, I didn't, of course, but um, I, I came that close because I was just so bored. Um, the ending is just not that interesting. The fight is... You don't... Okay, you don't see any of the fight. Every, like, every minute is inside the uh, Mogera's um, cockpit, and you don't even really see Godzilla and Space Godzilla have a cool fight. It's just the human characters reacting to the fight, and most of it is Mogera influencing what the two monsters are doing. And to add insult to injury, Godzilla is knocked out for a good five minutes of the fight, so... Ugh! I, I hate the ending fight. It's one of the worst end Godzilla fights. I absolutely hate it, and I think the film is poorly paced. It's just one of the most boring entries in the Godzilla franchise. Um... So that... So the plot is just poorly paced. Elements are introduced and quickly forgotten. And it's just overall a very jagged story with, um, you know, again, plot elements introduced and forgotten and just poor pacing. So um, the plot is bad. Um, and just to talk about Space Godzilla himself, um, just in terms of where he fits into the story, not about the character, he's a very basic Godzilla monster in that he just kind of shows up to destroy stuff and the only goal seems to be to kill him. There's nothing else beyond that. 
and it's been done to death. It reminds me a little bit of Godzilla vs. Gigan, and then that, that film too felt a, a tad plain in terms of its Godzilla story. And this film's even w w way worse than that. I mean, this film is just very, very plain. And um, the monster invasion story is a big testament to, me to that. It's just a very plain monster invasion story. So um, the plot is quite bad. It's jagged, it's poorly paced, and very, very plain. So, um, with that said, let's get into the human cast. I already talked about Yuki. Um, but let's talk about the other major character I really wanted to talk about, Mickey Sagusa. This is Mickey's, oh, what would it be, fifth Godzilla movie now? Um, and she gets, she finally gets a really, really, really big role in a movie. She's been a major character in every film since Biolanti. Um, but this is the film where she has a great chunk of screen time and influence on the story. Oftentimes, she's just there to read Godzilla's mind and tell people when he's going to attack. In this film, she's very influential on the story and is a big part of the plot um, in that she is in nearly every major scene. And it's a great idea, and like the rest of the film, it's a great idea that isn't fully, in and is, isn't fully and is poorly executed. It's just poor. And the big reason for me is because... She starts off carrying over what she learned in the last film, that Godzilla has feelings and is a three-dimensional character and is, you know, more than just a force of destruction. So she's decided to not fight Godzilla anymore, but instead to um, <clears throat> attempt to protect him. And that was her big realization in that film, and she was made sympathetic and likable for that. And her arc was very much so the theme of that of uh, Godzilla vs. Becca Godzilla 2, of Godzilla is more than just the force of destruction. Space Godzilla rehashes that theme like nobody's business, and Mickey is a big testament to that. She is basically the driving force of convincing everyone else in the film of that idea and I don't like that because we just did that in the previous movie and it was done more interesting and more subtly in the previous film. This one, it's shoved down your throat. And the problem with it being Mickey is that she was always, she's one of my favorite Godzilla characters and uh, her shoving this idea down everyone's throats and makes her come off as a, a ranty bitch. And a lot, of her, a lot of her dialogue in this film is extremely ranty and random. Like there's this one scene where, um, one of our lead, um, uh, one of our lead G-Force operators named Koji is talking to her about love. All of a sudden, she starts talking about how awesome Godzilla is and about how he sucks. It's, it comes off as ranty and almost a little crazy. Um, uh, so Mickey is has a, it's a great idea in this film to have her be that, but she's too ranty and too bitchy for her own good, and she will get such a better, better characterization and more interesting characterization in the next film. So stay tuned for that. But in this film. She's just a ranty bitch, and I really don't like that because I really like her character. Um, but she's, she starts off rather strong, but quickly devolves. So um, she's a great idea that's wasted. Um, I don't want to talk about anyone else specifically, only because I can, over, I can basically say everything I want to say about them with this one statement. <clears throat> they are annoying! Our primary tier um, G-Force protagonist, um, Koji and Sato, are on believably annoying. Their motivations are lost on me. They switch they switch sides between pro-Godzilla and anti-Godzilla like nobody's business and they're just annoying. The opening of the of the film is them doing quirky and dumb things and um, Sato especially comes off as a very cartoony and um, just very silly character and that makes him very annoying and um, uh, Koji as well. Koji perhaps even more so because Koji does a lot of the talking for Sato. It's almost like an Abbott and Costello thing, but um, not funny. Um, Koji has so many random realizations and just random switching sides. One scene he wants to save Godzilla. One scene he wants to kill Godzilla. The next scene he wants to save Godzilla again. The next scene he wants to bang Mickey. It's just... ah, oh, I don't like his character because he, his motivations are lost and he's just uninteresting because of that, and um, Sato is the same way. Just the entire cast is like that, they're, they're all annoying, um, except for the, the G-Force cast in the previous film, like um, uh, General Lasso, he's still badass, but um, the, you know, and them as well. But um, everyone else is annoying and cartoony and is uninteresting. So uh, that's my two cents on the human cast. 
Yuki and Mickey are the standouts. Yuki's awesome, Mickey's a ranty bitch, and the rest of the cast is annoying. So that's my two cents on the human cast. Um, so um, let's get into the monsters now. Um, I suppose we'll start with Space Godzilla only because he's kind of the primary force. Space Godzilla is a great idea and has a cool design. Um, I, I, I like that we're carrying over the idea presented by Biolanti of um, Godzilla's cells and impact on the environment and world is becoming bigger. Now it's space. Now we've got space monsters that are being created by Godzilla cells coming to Earth and destroying it. And that's a great and fascinating idea. And having a, another Godzilla from space is, another, is, again, it's a really interesting idea, but it's poorly executed. Space Godzilla very quickly becomes just another Godzilla monster. And the idea of him being another Godzilla is totally lost on me. Nothing is done with that idea. Um, there's one great scene where uh, Asuka is talking about how um, him and Godzilla have the same cells, but uh, he just comes off as a generic space monster um, in the end. I mean, he's a great idea. He ultimately needs a better movie than this, but... Um, Oh, I just I don't like Space Godzilla in this film. He needs a better movie. Um, his motivations are also confusing. We're not sure why he comes to Earth. Um, the the cosmos from Battle for Earth appear in this film briefly, and they say Space Godzilla is coming to Earth to kill Godzilla so that way Earth can be easily conquered. I don't see why he wants to do that though. All it seems he likes to do is sprout crystals around shit. I'm not sure why why he needs to kill Godzilla to do that, or why he can't do that on another planet. Why does he come to Earth? It would have been interesting if it was a reason like he wants to be the only Godzilla or something, but that's not even kind of brought up. Um, and ultimately, his, his motivations are just lost on me. He's a great idea, he's got a cool design, but otherwise he's poorly, poorly executed. He's a generic Godzilla monster in the end, and um, he, just, he needs a better movie than this. Um, Godzilla himself, um, I don't have a lot to say about him as a matter of fact because he's mostly just a carryover from the previous film of, um, you know, the more three-dimensional because of Mechagodzilla 2 Godzilla of, um, you know, he's still a badass and um, a force of destruction like he was in King Ghidorah, but now he's also got three-dimensional feelings like sadness and care. I needed more, feel more scenes with his, um, his adopted son. Because the ending of, God of Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2 is a very somber yet somewhat optimistic one for Godzilla. So I wanted there to be more scenes with his son, or again his adopted son, where that comes out and we truly see Godzilla has changed and grown as a character. There's one scene where he has an interaction with his son and it's so brief that it can be summed up as this is the way Godzilla acted with his son in the last series so it'll work, it'll work here plug and chug. It just, it's disappointing. I really wanted there to be more scenes between the two, because I feel like having, having a son with this particular characterization of Godzilla is a really interesting idea and can really develop him, but he only has one scene with him and it's not very long and it's, it's kind of simple. So um, I just wish that um, uh, he had more scenes with his son, because I feel like that would have really made his characterization distinct. Otherwise, though, he's fine. Uh, he's a badass and um, he does a lot of um, cool things in this film. Like I um, I love the scene where he destroys the tower, and I love um, I uh, I love the scene where he's attacking that that city before he attacks um Space Godzilla. Um, but overall, he's just he's just basically a carryover from the previous film. Um, so I really don't have a lot to say about him. I, I just I wanted there to be more screen time between him and his son. The last monster I want to talk about is um, a actual reworking of a previous Toho monster, not a Godzilla monster. Um. Mogera. Um, Mogera, as I said earlier, uh, first appeared in the Toho film The Mysterians, which I actually forget what year that came out. I think it was... Uh, I'm not even going to say because I don't remember. Um, but uh, Mogera first appeared in that film as a uh, weapon of the of the Mysterians, um, of the alien force in that film. And here, similar to Mechagodzilla in the previous film, he's reworked to be a weapon of G-Force that is uh, a good guy and attempts to kill Godzilla. Um, cool idea. I really like that we're getting to see Mogera again. I don't really like his redesign. Um, he looks way too similar to Mechagodzilla 2, and um, his original design was so weird and unique that I, 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 I resist this design because it looks so much like Mechagodzilla, especially with the fact that it has a tail. 
Um, I don't remember if the original Mogera design had a tail, but um, if it did, it didn't look... It, it, it's, I can still criticize it because it looks... The, the tail on this um, Mogera design looks like Mechagodzilla's tail. So, he's overall way too similar to Mechagodzilla. And before you guys go to the comments and complain that, but it was created by G-Force, so wouldn't that mean that they'd carry over, um, that they'd be similar design and have similar color schemes? Sure, but that makes Mulgara seem less distinct. Make something different. I don't care if it's more realistic. It's just not good, it's not good movie showing. Um, I don't care if it's realistic or makes sense. Just, you know... Um, or I care if it makes sense, but I, um, I don't care if it's realistic or not. I just want, I just want there to be some variety. So, um, I, uh, I, I wish that Mogera didn't look so much like Mechagodzilla, and, um, I would have been fine with this if they would have kept the overall, maybe changed the head a little bit. Like, I don't love the, the fact that the head has the same Mechagodzilla shape, um, but I wish that it had the classic golden blue color scheme of the classic Mogera. Um, he just looks too much like Mechagodzilla in this film. And his attacks are way too similar. I mean, just, it's basically the same name as for all the weapons, just mixed around. Like, instead of Plasma Grenade, it's Plasma Laser Cannon. Ah, it's just disappointing. And, um, overall, Mogera is just, um, overall just a generic redesign. So, um, and too similar to Mechagodzilla for his own good. So, um, he's alright, just too similar to Mechagodzilla from the previous film. Um, the only thing I really like about him and is unique is the fact that he can uh, split up into two different weapons, a uh, under, uh, underground digging tank and a starship called the Star Falcon. I really like that idea, and it's well executed and pretty cool looking, but um, overall he's just too similar to Mechagodzilla for his own good. Um, this review is trying to get very long, so I want to start wrapping it up. Um, let's talk about the effects of the film. Um... Here's the thing, this film was really, really rushed, and um, overall the effects aren't bad, they're just, they're kind of plain. I mean, there's nothing about them that is better or really worse, or, well worse maybe, but better or um, distinct from the previous film. The suits look okay, there's too many scenes where um, you can tell obvi uh, there are obvious flubs in their design. Like there's an infamous shot where um, Godzilla bursts out of the water, or no, he, he dives into the water, and um, his, Godzilla's tail falls off and just kind of hangs there. Um, so it's just really, really um, poor design, and it's just, uh, you know, it comes, it makes the film seem rushed, like, oh, they couldn't retake it? Um, and overall, just the effects are just very, very, just not, not as elaborate. There's, there's not as many fight scenes between the monsters, and the ones that are there, you don't see much of them. A lot of it is focused on the human cast. And, I mean, overall, the effects aren't bad. They're just not elaborate, not convincing at all. The scene where Space Godzilla fights Mogera in space is awful looking. Mogera and Space Godzilla look fine. It's their surroundings. It's a dark background with clearly on wires models of meteorites that don't move. It looks awful. It looks like a diorama a kid made in third grade. It just, it looks terrible. Um, I really think they would have been better off if they would have shot uh, Space Godzilla and Mogera in front of like um, a blue screen or something and just superimposed like a like a, a map painting or something behind them. It would look it would have looked so much better and so more cooler. This one looks terrible. Um, so the effects aren't bad, they're just kind of a downgrade, they're rushed, and overall they're not as much fun to watch as the previous Heisei films. And um, overall, they're just kind of poorly done. Um, they don't look bad. They're just not as good as the previous films and don't live up to the same standard. The Godzilla suit is good. He's a little bit too fat in the thighs, but um, not as bad as the previous suit. Um, he's a little bit more refined, but um, and the head is quite good. The eyes are a little bit troublesome for me because they look a little bit too... He looks a little too wide-eyed, um, which I don't really like. And the past suit had that too, but it's a little more... Um, obvious in this film, so um, he's a little too wide-eyed for me. Um, but the Godzilla suit's fine. Space Godzilla looks great. Godzilla's son, um, people have complained that it's kind of a downgrade from the previous uh, Godzilla's son suit, and that the previous um, suit of Godzilla's son was awesome, and that it looked very much so like a real baby Godzilla, unlike Minya from the previous series. And people have complained that this one looks just like Minya. I can see that. I don't think it's as bad as people make it out to be. Um, I think he looks fine. I mean, the suit itself is well made, but the design is a little bit... He's a little bit too cutesy for this continuity. Um, but he is definitely cute. I never got cute from Minya. I got cute from this baby Godzilla, so... 
I really like him, and he's ultimately pretty cute. Um, but overall, just, um, the effects are okay, they're just rushed. Um, so that'll bring us into the music score. This is the only Godzilla film in the... No, it's not the only one, but it's the only one in the films following Biolanti, not done by Akira Fukube. Um, I, I forgot to look up who did the score for this, but, um, a lot of people, um, call this music, um, forgettable. And I do definitely agree with that to a point. I think some tracks are quite memorable, like Godzilla's new theme, and um, the theme, what the, the um, opening credits theme is quite good. But the rest of it is pretty forgettable and really goofy, and um, doesn't it, it kind of gives that movie the goofy tone that it um, I don't think it was really going for. Like I didn't get that this film was going for a goofy tone. I just think that happened, and the music it doesn't help that. But I do ultimately like the opening credits music and. Um, the rest of it's pretty forgettable, though, and it's just really, really goofy, and um, doesn't really fit the actions that are going on on screen. And uh, obviously, it makes—I um, mean, if Akube's work is just just tramps this to the ground. I mean, there's nothing left. So um, uh, that's really all I have to say about the music. It's just um, really, really goofy and un and forgettable. There's a couple tracks I like, but um, a lot of the, a lot of the chords are repeating chords, and they don't sound good, and it makes the film sound really re repetitive. So, the music is pretty, eh. Um, which oftentimes in Godzilla films, the music is awesome. I mean, I've, I've only encountered a couple of them where I can literally say the music is not good, but um, and this is one of them. So it's surprising to me that we got one like that. Um, so I really don't like the music. So with all that said about Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla. Let's get into the rating. I really don't like this movie. It's a really goofy and unintentionally so kind of plain and silly entry in the Godzilla franchise that has a lot of ideas, that has a lot of interesting ideas that are brought up early but quickly forgotten. A jagged story, poor pacing, um, downgraded effects, and overall just a, a plain and generic, just kind of forget, forgettable entry in the Godzilla franchise. I ultimately say skip it. There's nothing that you're going to miss in this film that is brought up later. It's just kind of a forgettable and just plain entry in the Godzilla franchise and it's just really not worth watching. Um, so I'm going to give Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla a 2 out of 5. It's really plain and below average and poorly paced and poorly told story and is overall just a very forgettable film. So. Um, I do, um, I do recommend that you skip it if you're trying to watch a bulk of the Godzilla films. I say that there's a lot better... Basically, any of the other Heisei films is better than this film, so I say skip it. It's just really forgettable and goofy and doesn't fit in with the Heisei continuity, so... Um, well, I mean, it does, but it, it doesn't fit in with the tone of the Heisei series, so I say skip it. So, um, that way, you can move on to the true gem of the Heisei... Or one of the true... Well, they're all gems, but um, aside from Space Godzilla... Um, but, uh, the greatest ending to a film franchise I have ever seen in 1995 when the Heisei series concluded and Toho decided to, to, um, let their icon die a tragic and epic death in 1995 with Godzilla versus Destroya. I'll see you guys tomorrow for that review. Sayonara. Sayonara.